well, first of all, ladies, congratulations on your show, Stick to Sports on Vice TV. I honestly can watch you guys talk all day because I leave feeling educated. Of course, I laugh because you two are hilarious together. And then I want to be a better person. So I just have to ask you, I do. I know Kiri's looking like, hmm. Well, how is it possible? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> because as a Black woman in this medium, to see other women owning their voice and owning who they are and being unapologetic about that, it's yeah. inspiring. Yeah, yeah. You don't I, think you're inspiring, Carrie? You're like, oh. No, no, I agree. I think we get that a lot. I think that um, what Jamel and I have been able to capture with this show is just, um, honestly, just two friends talking. College dropout, Kanye. What happened to that, Kanye? What happened to graduation, Kanye? The like, Kardashians. Let's just keep it all the way funky. I do believe there'll be some form of football played. It won't look the same, but there will be. I always tell people this. Uh, there's always a plan. You just don't know how it'll all shape up. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I found Jamel um, at her home one day, and I brought a camera crew to her house, a camera crew to her house, and I said, hey, we're going to film something. We didn't know what it would be, but the idea was supposed to just be us talking. And while we were filming, a really good friend of ours said, there's something here. It's very creative. I like the idea of you two, you know, talking and being honest and being unapologetic. Um, and I think what happened was that we knew we would work together. We just didn't know what capacity because we've always been working together. When we were um, at ESPN, we would do periscopes and we would do, we've talked about this before, we would do, you know, Instagram lives and we would just share our opinion and people really um, appreciated it. Well, there were two things that you didn't see. Uh, two women, two black women um, in, in theory in the same space. But while we are very much alike, we're so very different you, from the way that we think about certain issues. She doesn't like ketchup on her tacos, from the way that we dress. Who does? The, that we, <laughs> the world does, Jamel. The world. Nope. The world is crazy. <laughs> you out there on the on your own. I'm, I'm, I'm by myself on that one, huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I and I just believe that um, it is so refreshing to see what you are. There's not a lot of representation. Even in 2020, there's just not a lot of representation. It's just refreshing to see, like, okay, this does exist. There is a space in which we can share an opinion and feel safe. I know more than anything work environments aren't always safe and I feel safe working with her. I feel mm -hmm. like she will always protect me. Like I like and I'll always have her back in in, in, in so many different ways. Whether I'm it's if we mess up and I say something wrong on air, she's like, girl, you know that mm -hmm. that's not his name. You know, or whatever. And vice versa. And so that just brings out the best in us. And I and I, I wish everybody could have that working environment because I know it's new and foreign to me. There's a call to action on everybody to find their voice in this fight to not only just be clear on who we are, but what we choose to put out into the world. So how did you two find your voice? Well, there's a temptation to believe that finding your voice is something that just magically happens. Mm -hmm. Like, poof, instant, yeah. I found my voice. <laughs> but I think it's, it's really a collection of experiences. It's living, it's time, it's wisdom. It's all of those things. And then that has to meet the moment where you really stop caring about what people think. And by that, I don't mean that you're not, um, you don't feel the responsibilities to family and community and whatever else is important. What it does mean is that you feel as if it's important to speak whatever is your truth or whatever truths that you see that exist without worrying about the condemnation of other people. Um, and so I don't know if that's a point that you'll arrive when you're in your 40s or if you're in your 30s or if you're 20s, but it, 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 you get to that intersection and once you get there, it's just kind of impossible, you know, to go back. Like, I can't imagine now going back to any <laughs> environment where I didn't feel comfortable and to borrow Carrie's words, safe in expressing what it is. Um, mm -hmm. Because I've lived that life before. And having lived that yeah. life, I realized just how unproductive and honestly, how draining that is. And I don't ever want to kind of return to that. And so, you know, finding your voice really means finding yourself, because that's what we mean by voice. Everybody experiences that though, so you're not alone. It, it, and some people find their voice as early as their 20s. I think this generation we're watching right now, as we watch these athletes, you know, um, on and off the court, on and off the field, uh, they are finding their voice rapidly. And you, again, have to be unapologetic. And, you, and as Jamel just said, be okay with someone saying you're wrong or that's dumb, or you have to ignore that. But that doesn't come overnight. You have to be so passionate and determined 
and and more importantly you have to believe that you have a purpose i think to share whatever it is that you should be sharing if i was out here just spewing some nonsense you know just because people people don't believe in that and they don't buy into that you have to believe the the lifestyle the experience that we're sharing uh, because we've been through a lot and we still don't i honestly feel like we still save people we have a saying like if i haven't even said anything about you i'm doing you a favor that's <laughs> grace and mercy that's right silence is grace sometimes I love that. In July, Disney announced a production deal with Colin Kaepernick, which includes a documentary series at ESPN that will be produced by you, Jamil. You're part of the team. What are your thoughts on this full circle moment, considering everything you've been through? And what can you tell us about the series? Well, um, it's still in its infancy stage, and it, it's the most unexpected but amazing opportunity I've ever received in my career. Uh, when Colin and I first started talking, it was not with the intention of me coming on as a producer for his incredible story. He just wanted to know the beats of what happened between me and ESPN, uh, because he did not want to get into business with somebody that could have harmed another Black person, which says a lot about him and his character. Um, and even though, uh, you know, ESPN and I, we certainly had our moments of disagreement and tumultuousness. I mean, the reality is I worked there 12 years. I'd say 10 of them were really good. Um, the last two, debatable about what that was, um, but that's okay. I mean, when I left there, I didn't leave on bad terms. I, I certainly left there with some feelings about certain people, but I didn't leave there on bad terms. I left there with most of my relationships completely intact. So when he called me and asked for my opinion, I was honest, but I was fair. And the reality is that the Disney platform, the ESPN platform presents him an incredible opportunity to tell his story the way that it deserves to be told. Um, my question for him was, can you get over the fact that ESPN contributed to a lot of the bad narratives that surrounded your story. And if you can get over that part, I think you have a real opportunity to shift the culture in a place that needs their culture to be shifted. And I think he saw that. Um, and I think he understood that it wasn't just about him. Um, he went into it with the intention of amplifying other people, amplifying Black voices, both those that will work on his particular story, but also inside of, of ESPN. And he's in a real unique position to do that. So I thought even though, um, you know, there probably would be some level of awkwardness there for both of us, not just for me, that the opportunity was just too attractive and it was too big and it meant too much for him to pass it up. And also for me, I mean, there's nothing that happened there that would make me pass up on an opportunity to finally give his story what it's due. Right, right. And it kind of, it makes, I don't want to say it makes what you went through, you know, make sense, but in a, essentially looking down the line, it's like, okay, everything is working out for our good when it mm -hmm. comes to this situation. I have one more question before I, before I let you go. I saw that you read the book Cast on Twitter. <laughs> For it happens when you give a book review. People just don't want to read it. Somehow it's my fault. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you tweeted, been reading Isabel Wilkerson's new book, Cast. And if you were of the opinion that the United States wasn't nearly as bad as Nazi Germany, how wrong you are. Can't encourage you enough to read this masterpiece. Now, a lot of people didn't agree with your take. Would you like to further? I know the book is so deep and it's hard to put all of your thoughts on Twitter when it comes to the book. Do you want to elaborate a little bit more on what you meant by that? I, uh, I will. Um, look, Carrie said it earlier, and it's true, is that part of the reason why we have such a difficult time discussing race in this country, resolving race in this country, is because we've lied about our history. We have run one of the greatest public relations campaigns in the world. Um, people don't realize when we say that we're the best, um, you know, we're the best country on earth, that's an affirmation, <laughs> okay? That's True. not a fact, <laughs> all right? And <laughs> this isn't to say I don't love my country, of course I do, but I love my country and realize its flaws. And one of the things that maybe people didn't know, which Isabel Wilkerson points out brilliantly in this book, and she's not the first historian to point this out, by the way, or first scholar, is that uh, Hitler and the Nazis learned from us. And they took our Jim, Crow's, uh, our Jim Crow laws and they created the Nuremberg laws, which behaved in a similar capacity 
in Nazi Germany during that regime. I mean, they looked at our system of racial oppression and they were, they admired it because they could not understand how the United States has such a stellar reputation in the world for being free and being a democracy, despite the fact that right in front of everybody, they were systematically uh, brutalizing and oppressing black people. And this is evident in any history book that you read. And it wasn't just that they copied and admired our racism. It was also the fact that when you look at the history of slavery, which I don't know, last count lasted hundreds of years. Um, you know, you, you saw the regular brutality, murder, rape and torture of black people. We did that. It happened on our soil. But the thing that we didn't learn that Germany did was that you have to, at some point, rectify that. They apologized to the Jews. They sent them reparations. Uh, when you go to Germany, you know what you don't see? Statues of Nazis. You know what you see in America? Statues of Confederate leaders, traitors of this country. You know, mm -hmm. I, I use this example because I think it should, it says everything about our racial history and our attempt to justify the ugliness um, that we have brought forth. John Lewis walked, he marched the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama for voting rights for equality. He almost died because he had his head cracked open. Mm -hmm. Edmund Pettus was the leader of the Alabama Ku Klux Klan. There's a bridge named after him. Mm -hmm. John Lewis is dead, that bridge is still standing. Mm -hmm. That says everything about America. So what I wanted people to understand by me saying that is not that I would say that current America is like Nazi Germany. I certainly wasn't trying to denigrate or diminish or belittle um, the persecution and extermination of millions of Jews, which is a key difference when you compare the countries, they needed us to work. That's really the only difference, right? But um, I want people to know that uh, the reason we're at this place and in this moment right now in our history uh, is because we have lied to ourselves about what our racial past looks like. And so we have this inflated mm -hmm. sense of superiority when we look at systems of apartheid in South Africa. We had apartheid too. It was called Jim Crow, all right? So we can't play that game of acting as if we're morally mm -hmm. superior to other nations. Yes, we have a democracy. Yes, we have freedom of expression, but there's so much that we haven't dealt with that we can't begin to heal because we keep right. lying to ourselves about what we are. Right, right. It's issues of the heart, not necessarily the ego and the money and what we can accomplish, but it's who we are as Americans. Yeah, and, um, and people hate to think of it this way. It's not just who we are, it's who we've always been.